Good morning and welcome to the 12th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2019. Item 1 is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items 4 and 5 in private this yep. morning? Yep. Thank you. Item 2 is another decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take consideration of a draft report on post-legislative scrutiny of the Control of Dogs Scotland Act 2010 at, in private at future meetings? Yep. Thank you very much. Item three is the administration of the Scottish Rate of Income Tax 2017-18. Can I welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning, Jim Hara, Deputy Chief Executive and Second Permanent Secretary, HM Revenue and Customs, and Jackie McGeehan, Deputy Director for Income Tax Policy, HM Revenue and Customs. Thank you very much for coming this morning. Can I please ask Jim Hara to make a brief opening statement? Uh, thank you, Convener. I just would like to make two short uh, points. First of all, to reaffirm HMRC's uh, commitment to administering Scottish income tax effectively, uh, which means providing a good service to the Scottish Government and also a good service to Scottish taxpayers so they can have confidence that they're paying the right uh, tax at the right time. Uh, and we, as part of that, can always improve and we have a, a, a joint oversight and governance arrangements with the Scottish Government, uh, including the Scottish Income Tax Board, which I have asked to oversee the steps that we take to gain better assurance uh, of our work. I, the second point I wanted to make was just to clarify uh, our inability to share the strategic picture of compliance risk that we have uh, produced for Scottish income tax. Um, it is part of our overall strategic picture of risk for uh, tax compliance, which uh, we do not uh, publish for operational reasons. Uh, however, we will include an assessment of the compliance risks and a summary of our compliance activity in our annual report uh, in September, and I'll be happy to answer any questions on our compliance plans. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Colin Beattie to open questioning for the committee. Thank you, Convener. Um, I've had a long-term concern about the uh, accuracy of the figures for the Scottish Rate of Income Tax in terms of the numbers of, you know, being able to capture the correct number of uh, Scottish taxpayers. Would you agree that uh, the base figures from 2016-17 are the key to the, the figures going forward? Yes, so identification of Scottish taxpayers is our prime uh, uh, sort of operational concern in making sure that we get uh, the administration of Scottish income tax right. And that is not a one-off process, it's an ongoing uh, process. There is no perfect benchmark against which we can measure ourselves, so there is no perfect index of, uh, of Scottish residents. Uh, we have uh, undertaken uh, considerable work to identify Scottish uh, taxpayers and to gain a level of confidence in how accurate our index is. And our assessment is that it's, we have sort of confidence in about 98 to 99 per cent of its accuracy. That doesn't mean the other one to 2 per cent is wrong, but it means that we have no means of corroborating uh, that. We have taken extensive steps and, uh, you know, I think it's as good as it can be but it, uh, at this point, but we're just continuously uh, improving it as we can. I mean, previously at an evidence session, the National Audit Office said that uh, the box of identifying a person as a Scottish taxpayer was on the self-assessment forms for 2016-17, but whether or not the box was ticked, no action was taken at that time. Does that create a concern about the baseline figures that we're working from? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. So, first of all, our prime way of identifying uh, Scottish uh, taxpayers is uh, through the address data that we hold uh, and all our efforts are in validating that ad address data and keeping it up to date. In the case of people who file self-assessment returns, uh, they are asked to confirm their address and those who file them online are also asked to tick a box to say if they are a Scottish uh, taxpayer. We have been learning over the last couple of years uh, how we can use the responses in that box to best effect. So, for example, uh, this year, in this year's tax returns, 
where someone ticked the box, sorry, did not tick the box and therefore did not signify they were a Scottish uh, taxpayer. Initially, we calculated the tax on the basis of what they told us in, our self in the self-assessment return, even where we held address data suggesting that they were Scottish taxpayers. And our intention then was to pick those cases up afterwards and understand what the, dis the reason for the discrepancy. But we very quickly learned that there were a large number of errors in the sense that taxpayers should have ticked the box and didn't do so, and therefore we quickly changed our business processes so that we do not <coughs> calculate uh, income tax on the basis of what is put on the self-assessment return. We calculate it initially based on what our data tells us is the residence of the taxpayer, and then we, we inquire into those discrepancies afterwards. So I think in the case of how we can make best use of that taxpayer representation on the SA return, it's uh, been a learning process for two years and might well continue to be. But if the 2016-17 figures are the baseline from which we're working and there is no follow-up at that particular time to validate that baseline figure, are we not kind of working in the dark here? I realise that subsequently you've come back on some of these figures and done some alterations in subsequent years, you know, picking out those 30,000 taxpayers you picked up. But nothing was done with the original figures, the baseline figures. Now, are they now irrelevant as a baseline, 2016-17? I think, I think we did a lot of work uh, to validate the Scottish taxpayer base in 16-17, including a lot of work to validate our address data against other uh, databases. You're right that we did not use the SA return uh, entries as part of that validation. I think our experience is particularly with the 17-18 returns, is that, that that is of limited use as a validation. Uh, it throws up a large number of discrepancies where what we have found is that the address data that we hold is much more accurate than what people are putting on their self-assessment But returns. if the 2016-17 outturn figure is the figure being used by the Scottish Fiscal Commission mm -hmm. and the OBR uh, for their forecasts, does that mean they're working from incorrect figures? No, our, our view is that they're working from uh, figures where we can be confident that between 98 and 99% of them are correct in terms of identification of Scottish taxpayers. And for the remaining 1% to 2%, we have no corroboration. Uh, some of those will be correct and some of them will be incorrect. But the National Audit Office says that no action was taken at that time by HMRC in terms of whether a person elected to be a Scottish taxpayer or not. That there was no follow-up on that. That's what the National Audit Office is saying. That's correct in relation to the entries on the self-assessment tax returns. It does not mean that we didn't take any action to validate the Scottish uh, Taxpayer Index, because we did, for example, uh, validating the addresses that we hold against third-party uh, data sets and following up discrepancies and mismatches between those data sets. The, you know, the, the entries on the self-assessment tax returns, you know, our experience is that they are not the best indicator of whether someone is a Scottish taxpayer because the error rate in them is higher than we would like. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, in order to, to make good use of that, we are going to have to continue improving uh, the accuracy of what taxpayers put on those returns. And in the meantime, we've taken the decision not to rely on what people put on those returns. So the 2016-17 return uh, outturn was corrected on the basis of addresses by HMRC. Yes, so what, what we did to create the 1617 uh, population of Scottish uh, taxpayers is, first of all, we put a flag on our systems for everyone uh, for whom we held a Scottish uh, address. We took some steps where we knew people held, had more than one address to ensure that the address that we hold is the correct residential uh, address. We then uh, tried to match the information in our data set with other address data sets, for example, the electoral register and from credit reference agencies, etc. And where there were uh, mismatches, we looked to see if we could corroborate wh which address was right. And more often than not, it was the HMRC address that was most up to date. Uh, and where we couldn't um, find any corroboration, we contacted taxpayers uh, to explore the discrepancy with them. And the result of that is that we are confident that the accuracy level in the Scottish taxpayer base is between 98 and 99%. Now, in previous evidence sessions, uh, we've had information in front of us that showed there were some concerns about identifying where there was a company, for example, operating across border, how they identify their 
resident employees. And that, in the initial stages at least, was a considerable problem. Has that now been eliminated? Um, so, what, so what happens is HMRC identifies whether a taxpayer is a Scottish taxpayer, not the employer. And we notify the employer uh, that we regard this person as a Scottish taxpayer and therefore you should deduct Scottish income tax. Um, the, you know, what we have found is that whilst the vast majority of employers do that correctly, in some payrolls they make mistakes, either because they haven't got their software right or because they haven't got their administration of their payroll right. Uh, we run, when we get their first return uh, of the financial, of the tax year, we can then run a scan against it to identify whether there are cases where they have not deducted Scottish income tax when we were expecting them to, in which case we would reissue the code and work with the employer to make sure that they get that right. Um, if, if, a, if an employer gets that wrong, it doesn't affect the amount of tax that the Scottish Government gets assigned to it, because that is calculated by reference to HMRC's systems. But what it could mean is that a taxpayer is having the wrong amount of tax deducted during the years they go along, and therefore when we did a reconciliation at the end of the year, would find that they either were due a repayment or had an unexpected tax bill. So it is important that we work with employers to get that right from the outset for the sake of taxpayers. Um, but there are fail-safes to make sure that we do pick it up, in particular a scan in year and then a reconciliation after the end of the year. Now you said you believe that your accuracy is about 98% or thereabouts. Um, how does that sort of accuracy compare with the rest of the UK? I mean, I realise it's a slightly different scenario, but you, you know, identifying UK taxpayers, you must have a, a percentage accuracy there as well. Uh, so, the, as I said, you know, there is actually no benchmark against which we can measure ourselves. Uh, all we can do is do as much operational work as we can to make sure we get the identification right and then carry out corroboration exercises with other data sets. Uh, we don't do that in the case of English and Northern Irish income taxpayers because there is uh, sort of no need to do that, but we do that for Scottish taxpayers and we now do it for Welsh taxpayers as well. And, and we would expect to you know, achieve that 98 to 99 per cent for both of those populations. And then our, our task is to maintain that and improve on that over time. And you say there's nothing to benchmark against. I mean, you're obviously benchmarking by just saying you're about 98 per cent accuracy. What is that based on? Yes, yeah, so what I mean is there's no perfect benchmark. So uh, yes, we do benchmark ourselves we corroborate the information that we hold in our data systems with uh, information held in third-party data sets. Uh, and where there is a mismatch or an inability to match, we look into that to see whether that is telling us anything about the accuracy of our uh, data set. And if necessary, we correct our data. Uh, you know, what that work has shown us is that, generally speaking, the address data that HMRC holds, which is the key thing that triggers us to put a, a Scottish taxpayer identification flag on someone is generally more up to date than the third party data sets that we uh, corroborate against. But our work identifies that we, we believe we can corroborate and be confident in 98 to 99%. And as I say, on the balance, there's no reason to believe they're all wrong. But some will be and some will be right. Uh, you know, we will continue to try and drive that up. Uh, but I think you know, we've taken all reasonable efforts that we can and there's no perfect benchmark against which we can check ourselves. And ask Sarwar. To follow up on, good morning, just to follow up on Colin B's question, does that mean if, if, if you're doing a data set based upon the address that HMRC has rather than what comes in the form, that you then also have mistakes where you have an English taxpayer wrongly identified as a Scottish taxpayer? And if so, how many cases of that are there? So uh, what our process is, our process is that where there is a discrepancy between what the taxpayer tells us on their tax return and what our database holds, we will inquire into that and resolve that discrepancy. Uh, the question is, what do you do in the meantime in terms of calculating that person's tax? Uh, the decision we initially took in this year's self-assessment run was that we would calculate their tax based on what they had said on their uh, return, but we quickly learned that the level of error in returns was such that it was actually better to calculate their tax based on what we knew from our own database and then follow up the discrepancy uh, afterwards. So we do, we do follow them up. Obviously, if someone notifies us on their self-assessment return of a change of address, then that's an update to our uh, database. But where they show us a Scottish address, but don't tick the box to say they're a Scottish taxpayer, that's a discrepancy that we have to inquire into.
So, so there's discrepancies both ways, which adds to the workload. Because uh, I think it's quite easy for us to think about one-way discrepancy which, and think of a high workload, but actually the discrepancies both ways, that's an even bigger workload. So how many discrepancies were there? How many queries? So we had to correct 30,000 uh, before we stopped the business. When we stopped the business rule, in the meantime, we had calculated tax for about 30,000 taxpayers based on their tax return, when in fact we thought would with hindsight, we thought it would be better to assess it based on the information that we held, and then we are carrying out checks into those and subsequent cases. You are right. I, mean, I, I think the error rate is too high, and therefore is going to give lots of sort of false positives that we have to inquire into. So one of our tasks is to uh, really improve the accuracy of what taxpayers so are putting on the Just to clarify, in terms of the checks and the, and the clarifications, was there 30,000 checks and clarifications, or is there a fewer number of checks and clarifications? Uh, no, there will, be, there will be more than that, because there were 30,000 where we had to do a correction, because yeah. uh, we concluded it was, base, it was better to initially assess tax based on our data set. <coughs> there will have been other cases after that where, uh, whilst we are, we are calculating based on the address that we hold, nevertheless we have to find out from I the mean, taxpayer. I, haven't a, I don't have a figure for that at this stage. But it will be. And the know, checks and clarifications are all letters, phone. It'll be. It'll be both. It'll generally be correspondence. Right. Um, and that sounds like a lot of work, a lot of resource. Yes, I mean money. this will be a lot of this will be unnecessary work because it'll be a simple error that someone has made, and so we have to look at things like the design of the tax uh, return and the yeah. the guidance that we've given to see if we can push up the accuracy rate that taxpayers give us. And how many members of staff? How much cost has that been to HMRC to do the clarifications and the? I don't have checks. figures. I don't have figures for that. Are you able to stage. put those figures together and provide them to the committee? Uh, we can get you whatever we have on that. Yes. Great. And in terms of the the manual entries, because that obviously there's a particular issue in manual entries, and, and MSPs are a good example of that. Around one third being classified wrongly. <clears throat> How many manual entries were there from Scotland? How many were uh, were incorrectly uh, identified? So our, our, our general business rule is uh, to set a Scottish taxpayer flag by reference to the address, and that is automated, and that's obviously for the vast bulk of uh, Scottish taxpayers. But for parliamentarians, there is a different legal test, uh, which is you are automatically a Scottish taxpayer if you're a parliamentarian, regardless of where you live. And therefore, we have to switch off the automated business rule and apply a, a manual uh, process instead, <clears throat> and we have a, 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 a sort of special tax office that looks after parliamentarians that carries out that process. So it is just the parliamentarians that are subject to that. Uh, is it only is, is it not sensitive individuals in the round and other or purely parliamentarians? It's so that would be our MSPs, MPs, and our MEPs, and so uh, MEPs, MPs, and and MSPs. So MPs with Scottish constituencies. So, so how many MPs or MEPs were wrongly classified? So, so uh, we identified 45 MSPs where we yep. had uh, given a, sent them an incorrect 1920 code which did not identify them as a Scottish uh, taxpayer and that was because of a clerical error in the tax office that looks after the affairs of uh, Scottish parliamentarians. We identified that before the start of the tax year and right. stopped the problem and corrected the cases right. that we got wrong uh, and we obviously alerted the MSPs whose codes had been wrong that they were getting to apologise for that and to issue them with a revised code. And we've also taken some steps uh, with the office to make sure that this obviously runs so there were no smoothly. MPs that were classified? Sorry? It wasn't an issue with MPs or MEPs? Uh, no, the, I mean, we have, we have double-checked all Scottish parliamentarians, and once the self-assessment process is complete, they will all have been taxed on the correct basis. But in the meantime, 45 MSPs did get the wrong code for 1920. Okay. Uh, that was corrected before the start of the tax year, so no one was impacted. Um, but we, uh, you know, we do have to improve our assurance of that process because it has to be repeated each yep. year. Uh, we are also looking at whether we can automate it, but uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not promising that we'll be able to do. <clears throat> do you understand why Scottish parliamentarians who set Scottish rates of income tax um, are extremely concerned by the fact that one third of them were wrongly um, identified? Um, and what that reflects on the challenges that may be happening with the wider population? 
I can understand that concern and I share it. I was, uh, as you might imagine, I was not pleased to learn that the mistake ha had been made. I am satisfied that there is no read across to the rest of the Scottish population because there is a special clerical process that applies to parliamentarians and that's what was uh, uh, went wrong. The process for the, the main bulk of the Scottish population is an automated one based on the address uh, set, whereas I say we've done extensive work to gain assurance about the accuracy uh, uh, of that set, but I mean, I share your concern that this should not have happened. And, and, and to your final question, um, uh, in terms of your communication with employers and employees uh, around the Scottish income tax, how, how do you think that's gone in terms of public consciousness around uh, the Scottish rate of income tax and how they fill the forms out differently, and, and how's that operating? How that, how's that work going? Mm -hmm. So I think I think our main message in administering <coughs> Scottish income tax. Uh, it to individuals is that they need to tell us when they change their address. They need to keep their address information up to date with us. Um, the vast majority do that. Um, for a lot of people until recently, there hasn't been any difference in, in the tax they pay and they don't need to do anything. So while you want them to be aware of the fact there is Scottish income tax, they, we don't want them to worry or do anything different. So our messages uh, across a lot uh, with employers and, and employees have been about address changes. We will continue to work with Scottish Government colleagues on mm -hmm. how else we they want to raise awareness, how we can assist with that. But for HMRC in administering, it's really about the, the addresses. Can I just pick up on the point Mr Sarbar raised, this issue about MPs, MSPs, and can I clarify, we're not asking these questions because we're concerned about our own tax affairs. We're concerned about it because it's a very small group of people. I mean, MSPs plus MPs plus MEPs must total about 200 people. It's a very small group compared with the bulk of the Scottish taxpayers. And for such a significant clerical error to happen with such a small group when there's a special process in place, that's the thing that really worries me about the confidence in the wider system. How could... I mean? I was one of the people, I'm sure you'll be delighted to hear, that I got an incorrect tax code. But how can the Scottish public have confidence when, for such a small group, 200 people, an error like that is made for, 40, for 45 of them? Many of whom, there wouldn't have been address issues because we've all been Scottish parliamentarians for, uh, for many years, so won't have lived elsewhere for, for a significant number of years. I can explain a bit. Uh, I mean, I, I understand your concern. If I can s explain a bit about the process that we have to apply in order to apply the special rules that apply to parliamentarians, and then how that uh, went wrong. So, because because there is a special rule that determines the tax status of parliamentarians, which is not based on their residency, we have to sort of switch off the normal business process which would allocate your, your uh, Scottish taxpayer status depending on where you live because there are some uh, Scottish parliamentarians and Welsh parliamentarians whose main residential address is not uh, in Scotland or Wales. So we, so we have to disapply that, which means that the default that our computer systems will, will give is we'll treat them as non-Scottish, non-Welsh taxpayers. That's only MPs. The, you misidentified 45 MSPs whose residents will all be in Scotland. So, but what, because, you're, because an MSP's taxpayer status is not determined by their residence, we have, uh, is determined by a different legal test, we have disapplied in our computer systems the normal rule that would apply to other Scottish taxpayers, which runs on their address. Uh, and therefore, as far as the computer system is concerned, the default is that people are treated as not Scottish, not Welsh uh, taxpayers, and then we rely on a clerical process in the office that deals with parliamentarians' tax affairs to put the flag back on the returns. Uh, what, the, what happened was that the office that did that did not realise that having set the flag the previous year, they would have to go back in and repeat that because the computer system would remove it again. So there was a misunderstanding and they believed having put the flag on an MSP's record once, it would, re it would be retained on the record. In fact, it was an exercise that they had to repeat before we re-ran the coding uh, run. Uh, and so for 45 MSPs, they missed that before we picked up our mistake and we had to go back and correct those codes. Okay. So it is a, it is a clunky 
uh, process, I, I acknowledge, that we have had to put in in order to make sure that the special rule that works for parliamentarians works. <laughs> if we did it the other way, then you, know, you, would, you, you would still get some errors the other way as well. Mm. So that's, that is the process that we have adopted. Unless we can automate it in some way, what we've got to do, I think, is gain better assurance of that clerical process to make sure that it, uh, you know, we don't make the same mistake again or another mistake and that's what Jackie and the uh, Scottish Income Tax Board have been looking at how we can do that. Okay. I understand. So, I, mean, so I, just, I think it's worth saying that we are looking at what we can do to automate all or some of this part of the process so that we're not relying on individuals having to go back every year and make, make these changes manually but it's a very small number of, in, of, of taxpayers as, as you say so we're, we're, we'll look at how we, best we can do that. It sounds like maybe your technology but also your checking processes just need to be tightened up. I, I would just like to repeat this is about our concern about this is about confidence for the wider population because we feel if mistakes can be made with such a small sample then. I entirely, I entirely understand that and share that. I mean what I would want to repeat is that it's an entirely different automated process that is run for the general population of Scottish taxpayers okay. who are not parliamentarians, so there's no direct read across. Thank you very much. Willie Coffey. Much <coughs> convenient. Good morning. I wonder, Jim, did you say, though, if there were <coughs> any errors in terms of the numbers of MSPs and MEPs miscoded? You said there were 45 MSPs, but did you say there weren't any? MPs and MEs, Scottish I, MEPs. I'm not aware of any. I'm aware that 45 MSPs for 1920 had a coding error, which we had to correct. I, I'm, not aware, I I'm not aware of numbers. I think there may have been one or two, but I, I, I haven't got the numbers. Right, so the, the, the clerical error just applied to the MSPs. I was one of the 45 as well, by the way. <laughs> I should say so. It just applied to the MSPs and not the Scottish MPs. As far as, far as I'm aware, I mean, what we did do is check every single parliamentarian, uh, both for uh, the 1920 tax year and for earlier tax years, to ensure that the correct a that the correct tax was being paid by each of them, and b that they, the correct flag was on their records, so that their tax would get attributed to the Scottish government mm -hmm. and not to the Westminster. Uh, government and we were satisfied when we completed all of those checks that following the correction to the 45 codes that we'd made uh, between the pay your own system and the self-assessment system that was going to achieve that. And it didn't apply to any of their Scottish lordships there must be hundreds of them as well I suppose. It's, it's any parliamentarian is my understanding. Right. Not, 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 not peers. Not peers. No. <laughs> right. Can I ask you about this, this other error that led to the 30,000 and the failure to tick the box or not tick the box? That kind of issue, if you don't mind me picking up on on that. You said before that the previous rule is, was kind of based on your address. That is the information and the knowledge within the system that would identify where you're from. But in the new form, there was a box where people were invited to say whether they weren't, where or weren't Scottish. Did the box ticking part of that process precede or take priority over the previous information that you already had based on the address? Was that the error? Uh, essentially, essentially, yes. So, I mean, the, the orthodox, our orthodox approach is whatever a taxpayer self-assesses, that is where we that's where we start in calculating their their tax bill. And then, if we have any doubts about their self-assessment, we can inquire into that afterwards. Uh, so that was why our default, when people uh, when we put the tick box on the self-assessment return, was well, whatever if people do or do not tick that box, that is the basis on which they are self-assessing their liability, and that's where we should calculate it. And then, if we are, if we have any concerns about that, we'll inquire into it afterwards. Uh, but as I said, we quickly learned that the error rate in people failing to tick the box was so high that it made more sense for us not to base the initial calculation of what people put on their tax return, but base it on what we believed, based on our data, was the correct uh, position. And so we flipped the we sort of flipped the business process over. If our address suggests that you are a Scottish taxpayer, then we will make our assessment on the basis that you are a Scottish taxpayer, even if you have not ticked the box to say that you are, and then we will explore that discrepancy with you afterwards, and if it turns out that you were right not to tick the box and your address was out of date, for example, we would fix that and, and repay any excess tax. But there will be, we concluded after our experience with those initial 30,000 cases that, that that would give a more accurate outturn than relying on what people put on their returns. Well, what you're saying is that you made the box ticking part of the process the principal determinant, the new principal determinant of where the person lived, rather than relying on the information that you probably already have about those people. Was the initial, that was the initial business uh, process, but 
that which we then have disapplied. And you, you no longer do that? You, no. Because you have the information, you had the information already that these people were probably Scottish, but you chose to make the determining factor whether they ticked a box or not. Yes, that's that's, the, that, that was the initial position. I mean, uh, if we can get the accuracy level on ticking those boxes up sufficiently high, I'm not saying we wouldn't return to that, but uh, unless and until we had assurance that the positive uh, sort of affirmation of, of residency status is correct right. in sufficient cases, we won't do that. In hindsight, that was probably a daft thing to do, wasn't it? In, in hindsight, it was based on an assumption about the accuracy of people's uh, work on that, which was unfounded. And, uh, you know, we, by the time we'd picked it up, uh, 30,000 cases had been dealt with in that way, and we decided that we would go back and adjust them. Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier, Jim, as well, that you're 98 99% confident that it's accurate and so on. Is that, is that based on your statistical approach to this? Is that a confidence interval? Uh, declaration you're making there? So, so, uh, so our statistical unit has calculated that figure. So okay. what we did was we, uh, we tried to match the addresses that we held with addresses in other data sets, and we got a match in about 80% uh, of cases, and the, the, the addresses sort of were corroborated in 96.5% of cases. We did some work then for the 20% where there was no match. Uh, sort of, so, for example, if uh, someone in Dundee uh, where we have a, a, an address for them in Dundee, but we could not match that with any other data set. We then looked at things like, well, who are they employed by? If they were employed by a local employer in Dundee, then it was clear that our address was correct because they were you know, employed in the local area, and so we would that was corroboration. Um, there is, obviously, if they worked for a national employer, we could make no assumption about that, and therefore we did not treat it as, as corroborated. Uh, and then where we still couldn't uh, get corroboration, we wrote to the taxpayers and asked them uh, questions about basically whether their address data that we held was correct. Um, and that's how we arrived at the figure of 98 to 99 per cent corroborated and 1 to 2 per cent uncorroborated, um, mm -hmm. of which some will be right and some will be wrong. Mm. <clears throat> Just in terms of statistical corroboration and accuracy, are you saying that it's a there's a standard 95% confidence interval might be applied to data sets like this. Is yours that? I'm a statistician, so I'll, I'll write to you if I get this wrong, but I think yeah. this is basically a 100% uh, figure. So mm -hmm. we've counted everyone that we regard as corroborated as corroborated and everyone that isn't as not corroborated. So it's a, it is, okay. I'm not aware there's any confidence interval in this at all because it was a 100% uh, scan of our database, but I will write to you if I've got that wrong. Okay, thank you. Supplementary on this point and ask Sarwar. You said to Mr Coffey that, that you, you write to them for clarification. What if you write to the wrong address? Because obviously if you're based on the data that you have and the, and the address is wrong, mm -hmm. then you're not getting the clarification because yeah. you're writing to the wrong address. Yeah, I mean, what we, in fact, what we found was in the interval between running the scan and issuing the letters, uh, we had actually had a significant number of address updates from taxpayers. So there was, uh, you know, unprompted, they had uh, sort of, updated us. Uh, in a small number of cases, they hadn't. You're right, there will always be some cases where you know, we cannot get a response, we cannot find uh, the taxpayer, we have, and therefore we have no way of corroborating whether the address data that we hold is the correct uh, address data or not. Uh, you know, we, we will not get to a point of of perfection. So on that basis, would you go by the address they put in their form and so the, under the box? Or in those cases, what you had? So in those cases, we would treat it as uncorroborated, so it's in the 1 to 2 per cent, right. but we would nevertheless proceed with administering the tax affairs based on the data that we hold, which is the Scottish address. Okay. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to move on to a slightly different topic. Uh, the HMRC's assessment of compliance risk on the Scottish income tax is based on uh, something called a strategic picture of risk, which I understand to be updated annually in September. Uh, in this instance, uh, HMRC didn't provide it to the Scottish Government until December, uh, I believe, and I believe the reason for that was that pressure on resources meant it couldn't be provided. So the first question begged is why were resources not available for something that seems so critical and what impact 
does the late provision have? So the uh, yes, yeah, so I th we aim, I think, to complete the strategic picture of risk process by about July each year, uh, and that would give us time then to get it to the Scottish Government by September. You're right that last year we didn't get it to them until uh, December, uh, and we have taken steps to make sure that that will be on time this year. It is part of a larger uh, sort of cross UK exercise that we do to complete a strategic picture of risk for the country uh, as a whole and then we've got a subset of that which is the Scottish uh, strategic picture of risk which focuses specifically on compliance with Scottish income tax. Um, it's, you know, there was just a general pressure of work which meant that that uh, exercise did not get completed as fast as we uh, would have liked. Uh, it does feed into our compliance plan which we publish uh, every year. In our assessment at the moment of the Scottish uh, income tax, in, so you know, in the first couple of years, 16, 17, and 17, 18, that the differentials between Scottish income tax and income tax in the rest of the UK were not sufficient to create any material uh, additional compliance risk. Uh, we'll obviously repeat that exercise for later years because the differential is now getting uh, more significant. Um, but I, you know, in in that year the difference in the threshold for a higher rate meant there was about a £400 uh, differential at the maximum, which we concluded was not sufficiently large to create, create a risk that we would need to take specific action to, to tackle. Uh, there are two, well, there are three levels of risk here. I mean, first of all, there's the risk that someone will not declare their Scottish residency or will try to, uh, try to disguise that. Uh, the second is that they will try to convert what would otherwise be income that is subject to the Scottish income tax into something else that is not subject to the Scottish income tax, for example, a capital uh, gain. Uh, or the third is that just generally they under-declare their, uh, their income, which is a general risk right across the tax system. Uh, depending on the level of differential, those, those risks could uh, differ between Scotland and uh, Wales and the rest of the UK. But at the, state, at the stage when we were doing this compliance plan, we didn't believe we'd reached that threshold. I understand. So just to reflect back, the, the, what you're saying is that the, the previous late provision has not, in your view, had a significant impact. Yeah. Uh, but going forward, any such late provision could do, presumably. Yes, I and think if that's right, then will you be providing one in September of 2019? Uh, yes, I think as the as the differential grows, I'm not saying at this stage that the differential is sufficient uh, to trigger additional compliance risks. That would mean that you would want to do sort of specific additional compliance activity, but we haven't reached that view yet with the Scottish Government. But you're right; the differential is now wider, and therefore it's more important that uh, you know we act timeously. And you know you have my commitment, and the Scottish Government has my commitment that we will be doing that on time this year. Which is September. Which is September, yes. Thank you. Uh, just final point, I just want to take you back, uh, Mr. Hara. The, you talked about the three tiers. So uh, I just wonder if you might uh, help the committee understand to what extent does the current uh, strategic picture of risk identify that risk about Scottish taxpayers misrepresenting their residency? Could you just give us a bit more on that? We have undertaken with the Scottish Government that we will assess that risk every year, annually and that we will base our proposals for any compliance activities on that assessment. Uh, we obviously have uh, some baseline data for 1617, uh, where you know, we, we've got baseline data about the Scottish population, we've got baseline data about movements of people in and out of uh, Scotland, uh, and that is, enables us to monitor trends as well as uh, risk assess individual uh, cases. At the moment, uh, to the extent that there is a risk, it would largely be amongst the highest net worth uh, taxpayers. And our compliance strategy for dealing with high net worth uh, individuals is an actual individual risk assessment. So each of them has a compliance relationship manager uh, appointed to them uh, and whose job it is to personally monitor that taxpayer on an individual basis. Um, and so I think at this stage, our monitoring of that is both looking at trends for the population as a whole and then specifically monitoring what high net worth individuals are doing or are saying to us. And we have a, a special Scottish uh, devolved income tax 
compliance uh, officer for high net worth individuals to make sure that Welsh income tax and Scottish income tax risks are taken into account in the, in the regular risk assessment of those people. Thank you. Alec Neil. Can I just uh, follow up on, on this? Because, uh, as you said, the differential now between Scotland and the rest of the UK is bigger than what it was to start with. Um, and from your trained analysis, particularly of the high net worth individuals, is there any uh, evidence of a compliant... I, I'm not talking people deliberately dodging or evading tax. I'm talking about just people taking a legitimate decision from their point of view to relocate from Scotland to other parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, is there any evidence that there is, as the differential increases, that there is any increase in relocation of high net worth individuals from Scotland uh, to other parts of the UK? I'll give you some figures that we have. Yeah. Uh, so, first of all, our definition of, a, our definition of a high net worth individual is someone with wealth of £150 million pounds or more. There's no parliamentarians uh, coming to that category. I'll take your word for that. <laughs> that <no> um, <laughs> uh, in 1617, we identified 608 high net worth individuals right. uh, who we regarded as having Scottish uh, taxpayer status. In 1718, we've identified 609. Right. Uh, so there is one more than uh, for the previous year. However, there has been obviously movement uh, within that. So yeah. of the of the 608 people who we identified as high net worth individuals in 1617, our records show that 16 of them uh, had the following year said that they no longer lived in Scotland. Right. Uh, they'd either moved within the UK or moved uh, abroad. But as I say, there's been a sort of corresponding change the other way. So we, we've got one more high net worth individual in 1718 uh, net than right. we had the previous year. So overall, um, the differential isn't impacting net in terms of uh, these people? I mean, as I say, 16, our records show that 16 people between 1617 and 1718 uh, changed their residence. I have no way of knowing what their motivations for doing right. that were. But overall, the number of high net worth individuals, according to our records, between those two years stayed almost constant. Right. Now, your definition of a high net worth individual, I think, was someone worth £150 million? Yeah, I mean, that's our main test. We have income levels and everything right. as well, but broadly speaking... Yes. But you know, below that, let, 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 for example, there have been claims made that the differential is leading to um, an exodus of consultants and people from the health service who would be paid, uh, depending on the status, something between £90,000 and £150,000, maybe slightly more. So uh, have you done any trend analysis on people, you know, who are um, high earners, um, but not in anything like the scale of net worth uh, that you've defined as 150 million. Yeah. No, HMRC hasn't. I mean, I think we have a slightly different interest, perhaps, than the Scottish government, because you know our interest is in whether anyone is behaving non-compliantly yeah. in relation to their Scottish income tax, and obviously, a decision to move residence is not a non-compliant action. It's something people are entitled to do. So yeah. we don't have a direct interest uh, in that. Uh, you know, the policymakers in the Scottish Government might have an interest uh, in that, and they have access to uh, data, and we would help them in any way uh, that we could if they wanted to monitor that kind of thing. Right. Uh, broadly speaking, we divide taxpayers into uh, high net worth, as I mentioned. We've then got another category called affluent, yeah. uh, who, uh, for whom we have another uh, compliance strategy, and then... Uh, I'm in the mass market, I would say, so that's probably what I'll call the third group. So what does the trend analysis show amongst the affluent? I don't have that information. I mean, obviously, in the case could, of... Could you send it, could you uh, send it to us? I can, I, can say if we, I can say if we have it. Yeah. Uh, obviously, in the case of high net worth individuals, each case is looked at individually, so that's how we were able to get at that yeah. uh, data. Um, I'm, so I'll see what we have in relation to the affluent group. Right, OK. That's very helpful. Uh, can I just go back to something you said earlier, um, that peers who are parliamentarians are exempt uh, from your special scheme for elected members, be they MSPs, MPs or MEPs. Why are peers exempt from that scheme? So, um, 
It's a decision that the government made um, when the this Scotland Act was, was, was finalised, but my assumption, and I'm afraid I'm, I'm, I'm guessing because I was, wasn't involved in it, was that um, peers aren't representing a constituency. They're not, it's not a geographical uh, area that they're representing. Yeah. So the link with Scotland is through where they, if they live in Scotland, they will be Scottish taxpayers. But I think there is there certainly used to be a specific definition of Scottish lords. Um, so it just be, I mean, we, we've actually, I mean, an interesting point would be we have had a number of examples of people who have been simultaneously MSPs and sitting in the House of Lords. So in that circumstance, would they be allowed to register as non-Scottish? They would be. Um, so, so the Scottish elected status then, would take precedence. Yes. Right. Um, do you know how many of the eight hundred odd lords we have who do such a wonderful job for themselves? Uh, how many of them uh, are registered to pay tax in Scotland? Do you know? I'm afraid I don't. Is that information you would be? I mean, I'm not looking for individual names or anything, obviously, but uh, is that? information, just the number that you would be able to give us? Again, we can take that away and uh, have a look at that. I don't, uh -huh. I don't immediately uh, see any reason why that would not be something we could disclose. Uh, that would be very helpful to see how many of them are actually paying the tax uh, uh, in, in Scotland as opposed to the rest of the UK. Can I, my third and final question is the treatment of allowances and reliefs. Uh, I mean, I saw a calculation recently that the pension relief alone is worth about £47 billion a, a year, which is very heavily skewed towards the higher end of the earnings scale. Uh, obviously, we don't have control over that, but um, <coughs> does that, where those reliefs take place, where people pay their pension and so on, that they get relief on, does that impact on the revenue assigned to Scotland? Yes, it does. So, uh, I mean, it's the, it's the net tax that we collect from Scottish taxpayers that is uh, uh, assigned to the Scottish Government. So, to the extent that someone's tax bill is reduced by a tax relief, such as for pension contributions, then that has an impact on the, on the tax receipts of okay. the Scottish Government. So, it, would it be possible for you to give us a figure? Just, I know, I just want to zero in on pension tax relief, because obviously that's something the Chancellor appears to have his eye on. Um, could you, would you be able to tell us, I don't mean just now, uh, of that £47 billion or so, how much of that relates to Scottish taxpayers? We can certainly take that away and ask our analysts whether we can produce that. Yeah. That would be very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Bill Bowman, please. Yeah, thank you, convener. Good morning. We've been speaking, I think, so far about the allocation of taxpayers between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Can you just tell me initially, how do you actually get into the system and when, when does your account within HMRC opened? I mean, we arrive in this country, we're either born or we fly in or some such thing. When do you start to take a, an interest? Um, it will vary. You may have a record with us uh, at any age. We don't automatically set up a record for taxpayers at, at birth, uh, but you may have a record with us because you claim tax credits or you claim child benefit or you have some taxable source uh, of income or you've claimed a repayment. Uh, our estimate of the number of Scottish taxpayers, the 2.5 million, is actually of the, the number of people who pay, in, pay income tax. There will be a larger number of people who are on our database who are potential Scottish taxpayers in that our, you know, our data would tell us that they are resident in Scotland, but they will be, for example, have earnings below the uh, personal allowance or will have income which is uh, not non-savings, non-dividend uh, income. So 2.5 million is our estimate of the actual number of taxpayers. So when somebody triggers your interest at that stage, do you then have a, a decision, either Scottish or not Scottish, or how does that work? The flag is on our system for everyone who we believe meets the criteria of a Scottish taxpayer. So for example, if you are someone who is self-employed and living in our growth and you're 
in the early years of self-employment, you're only earning £8,000 a year, whatever, while, while you set up your business. You're not paying tax because you're below the personal allowance, but the flag is on the system to say that you are a Scottish taxpayer. Uh, and so if you're, at any point, if your income goes above the level where you start paying income tax, that will be automatically identified as Scottish income tax. And for employees, where when an employer takes on a new employee, they now, they're now required to tell HMRC of the employee's address. So at that point, if it's someone's first job, we'll know that they have a Scottish address. But if you have no employment and no income, but you're still in Scotland, you would still be a Scottish taxpayer? You'd be a Scottish taxpayer if you, if you start, having, uh, start ha having taxable income. And you may or may not, if you're currently not uh, a taxpayer, you may or may not be on our database already. So you, you said that the two and a half million of people who pay tax, so that could, so others who are on your system could be people who have employment, but their allowances, whether it's pension or, or whatever. And just to be clear, I mean, pension payments are perfectly legal. There's no issue about that. I mean, it's good to save for your pension. I would agree with that. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you know then, have an estimate of how many over the two and a half million there are? I think from memory it's about three and three quarter million uh, people on our databases in uh, total, in total uh, have a flag against them to say that they are, you know, our records indicate that they're resident in Scotland, of whom two and a half million are active uh, taxpayers. And the other point that was touched on, those who are um, not recording or avoiding um, or evading, I should say, mm -hmm. say tax. Do you apply rules of pursuing those people across the whole of the UK, or is there a difference between Scotland and the rest of the UK? So at the moment, there is no difference between Scotland and the rest of the UK in the compliance activity that we uh, undertake, uh, and we just do that on a UK-wide basis. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the future, it may be uh, that we will have a specific Scottish income tax uh, compliance plan if we believe there are specific risks in relation to Scottish income tax that we need to uh, manage. But at the moment, uh, what happens is the Scottish Government gets attributed to it a proportion of the uh, yield that we bring in from our compliance activity across the UK. So just finally, do you have any indication whether evasion is higher or lower in Scotland? Uh, we have no evidence to suggest that it is higher or lower. Uh, in Scotland. Uh, so, uh, I mean, obviously there are some regional differences in the makeup of taxpayers which affects the inherent compliance risk. So, for example, employees tend to have a very low uh, compliance risk because they don't really have the opportunities uh, uh, to evade in the same way as, say, self-employed people have, and there are regional variations about how that population is made up. But uh, we are not aware of any national uh, tendencies to evade or not to evade. But is Scotland in that um, balance between employee and self-employed? I, th I think it's, it's, I mean, we tend to go on who's in self-assessment and who's in pay as you earn, and roughly speaking, I think it's about the same. It's about 16 to 17% of taxes are paid through self-assessment, and the balance is paid through pay as you earn, and that's roughly, roughly the same. Is the rest of the UK? Yeah. Okay, do members have any further questions for our witnesses from HMRC? Can I ask a small techie question then? Um, will the 1819 revenue estimate also take account of the 1718 Scottish income tax outturn data, which will be the most up to date information at that point? Uh, yes, it will. So, uh, in previous years, when we made estimates, they were we had no outturn data, so they were made purely on the basis of the survey of personal incomes. Uh, but this year, for the first time, we'll be able to make our estimate based on that and the outturn from the previous year, uh, you know, as will the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the Office of Budget Responsibility. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I now close the public session of this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>